The personal finance iceberg is something that I've been working on. See, the term personal finance covers many aspects related to money, from banking all the way to your retirement. And this iceberg video is gonna be covering many topics from basic to advanced to help you understand a lot of these terms. But for this video, I'm just gonna try my best to just simplify these terms. My goal isn't to teach you everything that there is to know because honestly, there's too much. It's just to make you aware. So let's begin. Level one, money. Now, it's not just about the cash that you have in your wallet or the numbers that you see in your bank account, but it's more about the backbone of all of our transactions. It's the overall essence of transactions because money is just a tool that simplifies trading between people. See, gone are the days of bartering for goods directly. Money acts more as a universal medium of exchange, just making things more straightforward. And money also serves as a common value, helping us easily compare prices of goods and services. But this allows more for budgeting and overall financial tracking more manageable. And globally, money comes in the forms of all different types of currencies. And these values will depend on the situation. Bank accounts. Bank accounts are your financial safety locations. And overall, they're part of securing and managing your money. And what they're going to do is they serve as a financial hub or a central hub for your money. And this is going to allow you to track your overall deposits, your withdrawals, your transfers for your income. But it's more than just a place to store your cash. And depending on the bank you go with, it's often more or less a financial tool of your money management. See, picking your bank can depend on multiple factors, such as location, services needed, or overall eligibility. But when picking a bank, make sure you review things such as trustworthiness, customer reviews, and ensure that they have federal FDIC insurance. This guarantee ensures that if anything happens to your bank, the government will guarantee your money is safe up to $250,000. Checking account. Now, if you dive deeper into bank accounts, the first one you're going to find is a checking account, and this is your everyday financial account. And what this does is it gives you an immediate access to your funds and think of it as your ins and outs for your daily transactions, all the way from depositing your first paycheck to paying your monthly bills and even using it for your daily shopping in the form of a debit card. And while there are many different types of bank accounts to use, a checking account is one for most cases where you're going to interact daily. Savings account. Now, on the flip side of having your checking account where you're using it for your daily needs, a savings account is your overall financial nest egg, and you're using it to safeguard your money. Think of it like a piggy bank. The money in your savings account is primarily used for certain events that you save up for, something like a vacation. But to get the most out of your savings, look into a high-yield savings account. With a high-yield savings account, your money just doesn't sit there. It actually grows, earning interest, moving you closer to your overall financial goals. Like the name suggests, it's allowing you to earn interest over the normal accounts, where typically with a checking or a normal savings account, you're earning nearly 0%. Emergency fund. And just like your savings account, this money is put to a purpose. An emergency fund is your financial safety net for just that, emergencies. It's designed to cover those unexpected expenses like medical bills or last second car repairs, or even sudden job loss. But this fund is meant to be separate from your normal savings accounts. See, this is the bottom of the barrel funds, something that you shouldn't touch. And experts recommend having at least three to six months worth of your living expenses saved up. But this money should only be touched in the event of an emergency. See, it's more of a peace of mind knowing that you're ready for anything. And I recommend keeping your emergency fund in a separate bank account. See, this will add a layer of separation that you can mentally help to keep things separated. Budgeting. Having a budget is a form of your financial planning to track your overall income and expenses. And having a good budget gives every dollar a job, whether it's covering bills or paying off your debt, or even trying to put money towards savings or investing. But a budget is an overall blueprint for financial success, and having one helps you make informed decisions about your money. A budget can be as simple or as complicated as you want it to be. And getting started, you can make a budget on a sticky note. All you have to do is on one side, write how much money you're making, and on the other, write how much money you're spending. This will give you an overall great picture on what you're doing every month. Level two, money market account. Now, money market accounts are sort of the middle ground between banking with a savings and investing, and each bank may call this something different. But these accounts often return something around a high yield savings account and a CD. These accounts are all about giving you access to your returns while keeping your money readily accessible. But if you're looking to maximize returns on these funds, you might lean towards looking at all options available. Passive income. Now, passive income is a dream for most people. Essentially, it's earning money while doing little to nothing. So in your sleep, while you're on vacation, 
It comes from sources like rental income, stock dividends, or even having a side hustle set up and letting it run by itself. But don't be fooled by the passive part. See, it often requires upfront work for your investment. And the more you want to earn passively, well, it takes more effort for you to put in initially. A source of passive income that we already talked about is a high yield savings account. Accounts like these pay interest monthly. So essentially you're earning income on your money. And hypothetically, if you had enough money set aside, you could already be financially independent on just those returns. The economy. Now, the economy is a big term for the overall global financial scene. And it's everything from how much things cost to how easily it is to find a job. It's all connected. See, from personal financial decisions that we make every day, the micro, to the global financial trends that move the overall markets, the macro. But understanding the economy helps us make smarter decisions about our savings, our spending, our investing, and it'll overall guide us through our daily decisions. Investing. Now, investing is where you turn your money into more money. It's the art of being able to spot opportunities, whether it's in the stock market, in buying bonds, putting your money into real estate, or having your cash put to work. And while this may be exciting, investing comes with risks. The goal for investing is to make informed decisions and being able to spread your bet across different assets to safeguard against losses and aiming for long-term growth. See, investing is not just being able to make fast money or quick cash, but it's about being able to build wealth over time wisely and being able to keep it. Compounding. Compounding is a form of magic for your money. See, when your investments earn money, well, those earnings make more money and earning returns on both your original investment and the returns you received. See, it's like a snowball effect with your portfolio being able to build upon itself. And over time, this cycle can turn your portfolio into a small fortune. But the trick is starting early. See, investing $1,000 at 18 years old can grow to over $24,000 by the time you're in retirement age by doing nothing. But if you were to wait until the age of 25, just a difference of seven years, you'd only see $15,000. And that's a $9,000 difference for just starting late. Using different compounding calculators shows why starting early is key to building wealth. So with time and returns, the longer the better. Level three. But before I get into that, if you're finding any value from this video, feel free to subscribe to the channel and give me a thumbs up. I'm on the road to 1K and it'd be greatly appreciated. Wall Street. Now, Wall Street symbolizes the heart of investing financial markets in the United States, and it's the home of the major stock exchanges like the New York Stock Exchange. And this is where the global fortunes are effectively made and lost, and it significantly increases the overall global financial system. See, now you're likely familiar with the scenes of stockbrokers yelling buy and sell on the stock floor. And while it's more modernized with computers, the factor of buying and selling assets is still the primary goal. And understanding how Wall Street operates is crucial for anyone looking to invest or understand the global economy. And while Wall Street is a physical location in New York, beyond the street name itself, the name Wall Street has become synonymous with the overall investing sector as a whole. Rule of 72. Now the rule of 72 is a simple formula that people use to estimate the number of years it takes to require to double your investment. And this is given with an annual rate of return. See, by dividing 72 by your investment's annual rate of return, you'll be able to gauge around how long it's gonna to take to grow your initial investment. And you could use this to highlight the power of compounding interest because it's gonna give you an overall calculated expectations of return. So for example, with the rule of 72, it states that every dollar invested that has an annual expected rate of return of 10%, it would take about 7.2 years to double your money. Recession. Now a recession is a significant decline of financial activity across a country's economy. And this could last for more than a few months or even years. See, it's visible in factors like GDP, income, overall employment, and output manufacturing. And understanding a recession can help you prepare for the overall economic downturns and making informed decisions in challenging times. Now, the last significant recession the U.S. had was during the Great Recession from 2007 to 2009, while the COVID recession was the shortest on record. And since the global economy tends to grow over the long term, a recession and an economic hardship always inflicts bad news. But thankfully, the rate of recessions have decreased over the past 40 to 50 years, and this is possible because of the current systems and the overall modern tools that we have in place. Retirement. Now, this is the long-term planning or the overall retirement planning strategies that you're going to be using to prepare financially for the time that you're no longer allowed to have steady income from your overall employment. Now, this is going to involve you saving, investing, or even using different strategies to ensure that you can maintain a desired lifestyle into your later years. 
See, when you personally highlight the importance of being able to start early, you're able to take full advantage of the overall compounding growth into your later years. See, the younger you are starting your retirement, the longer you have to prepare. Now, some easy methods of investing with your retirement include setting up a 401k with your employer or using or creating a personal IRA. A 401k and IRA are some of the most common accounts that most people use to set up investing for their retirements. To compare to what you need to retire, just do a simple calculation on your expected living expenses and your overall life expectancy. And for example, professionals estimate a 1 million retirement account to cover retirees living expense for at least 20 years. But this can all depend on your personal living situation. The lottery. Now the lottery can often seem as this harmless gamble, but it's often just a false reminder of dreams to get the instant wealth versus the reality and the actual odds. Now you'll often see billboards of being able to win millions if not billions of dollars, but if you understand the stats, you're more likely to be struck by lightning. And the odds of winning that overall Mega Millions jackpot is about 1 in 302 million. And even if you win, most people end up poor after a few years. While many put money in lotteries in the hopes of winning, it's likely a reality that you'll only spend the money. At the end of the day, these state-run lottery programs are just a way to raise funds with sanctioned gambling. The lottery should not be a financial plan and should only be seen as a form of entertainment at best. Bulls and Bears Now in the stock market, you're either a bull or you're a bear. Bulls are all about prices going up, believing in long-term growth, while bears expect prices to drop, seeing a downward ahead. But these aren't just feelings. See, being a bull or a bear can guide you on how you invest, whether you're buying in anticipation of growth or bracing for a fail. And there's going to be perma versions of these too. People who always see the market either going one way or the other. Like a perma bear is going to be someone who always believes the market's going to fail. And a perma bull is always someone who believes the market's going to grow. Knowing these overall emotional moods can help you understand the market trends and where you might fit as an investor. Bonds. Now bonds are like giving a loan to a company or a government and getting promised regular payments back in interest. It's a safer bet for your money than stocks because you know exactly what you're supposed to get back and when, and it even comes with included tax benefits. But the interest you can return back on a bond is different depending on what bond you get. For example, in one year, getting a short-term bond might get you a 5% return, but the next year, it might only get you a 3% return. Analysts look at these returns to guess how the overall economy is doing. Higher returns mean that the borrower really needs cash, so in this case, it would be the government. And the overall term of a bond can vary from short term all the way to long term as far as 30 years. Commodities Now, commodities are raw materials like gold, oil, wheat, or soy, and investing in these can guard your money against overall inflation, and it adds variety to your overall portfolio. Some people have been swear by gold and silver as must-haves in any portfolio, especially as a safe bet during the overall global economy. But remember, the overall prices can easily swing based on countless factors, and while this can be a solid hedge, they're not without risks. And just like any other asset, these can depend on timing and other factors. Inflation now, inflation is like watching your money shrink without actually losing it. Imagine what $100 could buy you back in 1970 as far as what it can buy today. That's inflation at work. See, even though you didn't lose any money, your money actually buys you less over time. This is a silent reducer of your purchasing power, while at the same time, the general price of goods and services can climb. But while it might seem all doom and gloom, overall inflation isn't only bad news. See, it's an overall natural economic phenomenon, and it's natural to happen within any economy, but you need to keep an eye on inflation. And to help you, experts use tools like the Consumer Price Index or the Producer Price Index. What these track are prices that change for the consumer and producer. Like consumers look at the price of milk and bread and other household goods, while producers look at other import and exports like lumber and wheat. Credit cards. Now credit cards can be a double-edged sword. They're like getting a loan from the bank every time you use them, and it's having direct access to the bank's funds. Now a bank will issue a credit card based on terms and a set amount. However, with high interest rates and the overall temptation to overspend, this can always lead to debt. But when you use them wisely, they can help build your credit score and offer rewards like cash back and overall travel points with additional layers of fraud protection. But if you mess up and overspend or not pay off the balance in full, you can quickly fall into the debt trap. The key for credit cards is being responsible for them and being able to pay them off with a full balance at the end of each month. Real estate. 
Now, whether you're buying a personal home or investing in a rental property, real estate has been a long cornerstone of wealth, with many millionaires attributing their money in part to their real estate holdings. However, in recent years, the cost of housing has skyrocketed, in part to the interest rates. In 2020, interest rates were near 0%, and in 2024, the average mortgage rate near 7%. This means the overall cost of housing is nearly unaffordable by comparison, and if you were to do a comparison on the same house, purchasing at the same price, this would nearly equate a doubling of monthly payments by just the interest rates alone. And when you break this down, this can cause an unstable housing market, with a group of people buying at a low rate not wanting to sell, and a group of people not wanting to buy due to the high rates. All at the same time, renting prices will only increase to hurt those unable to get in the position for a mortgage on a house. So before you buy a house, make sure you do the research and run the numbers on renting versus buying. Because buying a house comes with the overall financial ownership, meaning more risk and responsibility. Level 4. SEC. Now, the SEC, or Securities and Exchange Commission, plays an oversight role in the financial markets, as it was established to do just that, regulate the markets and protect investors. The SEC enforces laws against market manipulation and overall fraud. And as an investor, understanding the SEC's regulations can help you navigate investments more safely, ensuring that you're informed and protected against unlawful financial activities. However, as the SEC is a federal agency, it's limited to the funds and processes of the government. So as you can imagine, in the world of finance and scams popping up every day, the SEC is unable to cover all bad deeds. With the agency undermanned and underfunded, the SEC is often pursuing only the larger issues on the radar. And unfortunately, smaller issues seem to go unnoticed. Trust. Now, trusts in regards to finance is a legal entity that holds assets on behalf of beneficiaries. And while wills and other documents may be more passive for life planning, a trust is more active oversight in managing assets more efficiently. Trusts often provide a tax advantage while still protecting wealth for future generations. But with trusts, assets are not truly managed by one individual, but more of a management holding. And this allows certain access to specific individuals. Making trusts can be as complex or as detailed as the initial creator established, and it can even restrict how the recipients and what they can do with money. The two main types of trusts are revocable and irrevocable, and the difference between the two is mainly the amount of flexibility to change the details after it's established. Accredited and unaccredited investors. Now, in the world of investing, there are two types of investors, accredited and unaccredited. See, accredited investors are typically a high net worth individual that has access to investing opportunities that aren't available to the public. These are things like hedge funds and private equity investing. And some of the requirements to meet eligibility is having a high net worth of over $1 million, and this doesn't include your house, and having a proven annual income of over $200,000 for the past two years. Now, in order to be verified, a person must submit multiple documents to prove sources of income and salary, such as bank statements and tax forms, and an unaccredited investor is someone that does not meet these requirements. This distinction was implemented by the SEC and was designed to protect most investors from high-risk investments, such as private investing. Share buybacks. Now, share buybacks or stock repurchases occur when a company buys back its own shares from the public marketplace. This reduces the amount of outstanding stocks in the market. This can increase the value of the remaining shares as it's often seen as a sign of self-confidence in the company, while fewer shares remain in circulation. When this happens, shareholders get a larger stake in the company as the decreasing amount of shares. But it also raises debates on the best use of corporate profits, as a company has multiple options to do with this money, such as pay down debt used towards research and development, or pay shareholders a dividend. Venture Capital Venture Capital, or also known as VC, is a form of private equity. And it's a type of financing that investors may provide startups or small businesses for long-term growth potential. In the case of a small business starting out, they may seek outside funding or initial funding from external sources to help grow its products or services. This offers a great lifeline for great ideas and companies that don't have access to private markets. Venture capital tends to come in the form of private investing organizations rather than an individual person. Angel Investors Angel investors are wealthy individuals who provide capital for startups. And just like the previous entry where venture capital is more of a private organization, angel investors are more of personal entities or individuals who are looking to seek initial ownership of companies. But unlike venture capital, angel investors tend to provide support in a more personalized setting, as an angel investor tends to be found during the initial growth phase of the company and is often close to the initial founder. This can be close or related individuals such as friends, families, or even coaches or mentors. Wills. Now, wills are essential for estate planning after you pass. What this does is it ensures that there's a legal plan of your. What this does is it ensures that there's a legal plan of your assets after you die. 
This is a legal document that ensures your assets or plans are distributed according to your last wishes. See, after you die, there's a probate process, which is a judicial process where a court of law ensures that things are valid to enforce, and these documents assist them. It's all about taking control of your financial legacy after you pass, and protecting your loved ones can make sure that their wishes are also well known. See, this is all about taking control of your financial legacy after you pass, by protecting your loved ones and making sure that your final wishes are known. See, without a will, the federal or state laws will decide how your assets are divided, which might not align with your intentions. Getting a will established can be as low as $100 depending on your requirements and what assets you have, and to get a will set up, seek out legal or financial guidance. IPO An IPO, or an initial public offering, occurs when a private company becomes public by offering its shares to the public stock market for the first time. This is a way for companies to raise more money and more capital as it allows final access to the public markets, which include public investors. And for new investors, IPOs can offer a chance to get in on the ground floor of potential new successful companies. For example, a company like Apple IPO'd in 1980, and since then you would have nearly returned a 140,000%. Now the process for a company going public is a long road, and the company initiates the process by engaging with investment bankers and financial advisors which leads into regulatory filings and processing with the federal agencies. It is only after this road where a public company finally can be publicly traded. Index funds and ETFs. Now I bundled these together as they offer a similar way to invest in an overall broader market, and the name depends on the platform you're using. See, what these funds offer is a gateway to investing in the overall stock market without having to put all your eggs in one basket. They're a way for you to invest in the stock market with diversification benefits. See, instead of investing in a single company like a stock, an index fund or an ETF allows you to receive the performance returns of multiple stocks. These will mirror the ups and downs of the stock market index like the S&P 500, with its hands-off, smarter way of investing, especially for beginners. You can choose small funds that only invest in a few companies, or you can find ones that invest in many. Some funds like the Vanguard Global, ticker symbol VT, have as much as 10,000 holdings. This way of investing is an excellent choice for beginning long-term investors who are looking to mirror the performance of a specific index or the overall market. Stocks. See, stocks are your ticket into owning a slice of a company. And when you buy stocks, you're betting on that company's future success with ownership. And if they do well, well, so do you. See, companies can go bad, leaving you actually with less than you started. And that's why savvy investors spread their investment across multiple sectors. This decreases risk through diversification. Because remember, the aim isn't to win overnight, but to grow your investment steadily over time. You can buy stocks by opening a brokerage account like TD Ameritrade, Vanguard, or Fidelity. These are accounts that allow you to buy and sell stocks. FIRE now, the FIRE movement, standing for Financial Independent Retire Early, is a financial lifestyle movement with the sole goal of saving and investing to retire as soon as possible. There are four main different levels to FIRE. Lean FIRE is a planning lifestyle which expenses are much lower than they average in order to save and invest more, leading to a lower expense lifestyle which will allow you faster goal to retirement. Coast FIRE is all about saving and investing enough money so that you can eventually stop making overall contributions. So in other words, you'll be able to coast into retirement. Fat FIRE is where you want to live a more lavish lifestyle which will mainly require a higher income and aggressive savings. Barista FIRE is working a more hybrid retirement where you'll still have a retirement amount but you still may or work a part-time or a relaxed job. Now overall, the FIRE route that you select will definitely depend on your retirement plans and expenses. The standard FIRE savings and investing can be as high as 50% of your monthly income. This overall lifestyle is done to retire earlier than the traditional lifestyle ages so you can enjoy your financial freedom. Level 5 Forex Now, Forex or the foreign exchange market is the largest financial market in the world. This is where all major global currencies are traded 24-7. It's the overall backbone of the international trading and investment community, as it allows businesses and investors to convert from one currency to the other. Now, Forex trading has different rules than traditional tradings like stocks and bonds. Forex relies on pairs. This means it's traded and completed on two separate currencies, such as American dollar to the British pound, or other mixes, or other pairs. So trading Forex doesn't just require you to understand one currency, but multiple pairs. This is a global understanding in currency and requires you to understand the global economy and its impacts. Understanding Forex is important for investors who want to understand currency fluctuation and understand global indicators. Futures Now, future contracts are an agreement to be able to buy or sell an asset at a predetermined future date and price. 
Futures are similar to the overall concept of options. However, options allow you the ability to exercise at any time before they expire. But with futures, you're strictly limited to the set time frame at the date of purchase. And these can be anything such as commodities or currencies, and you can use these to hedge against future price fluctuations, or you can use them to speculate on the overall market movements. But just like stocks and options, they're complicated and carry a real risk. And these are an advanced tool that should only be used by an experienced investor. SPAC. Now a SPAC or a special purpose acquisition company are sort of like shell corporations. But what these companies do is that they're designed for a company that's going public without actually going through the traditional IPO process. Now we talked about IPOs earlier in the video and for this process, a SPAC is a company that does the work for them. See SPACs tend to be financial companies that are already vetted through the IPO process, but after they go public, nothing happens. Their main use case comes in the factor of when a company actually wants to IPO. See, the company doesn't really have to go through the IPO process, it would just merge or buy out the SPAC and that way it streamlines the IPO process. What this does is it quickly allows the company to be publicly traded without having to go through all of the vets. And the best example of this is having your friend wait in line for you, but right when they get to the front you just swap back out. Now SPACs have gained popularity over the recent decade as it's an easy alternative for IPOs for most companies. The Federal Reserve now, the Federal Reserve is a central banking system of the United States created in 1913. And while on social media people think that the role of the Federal Reserve is to print money, it has a more important role of the overall American economy. See, its role is to control the overall monetary policies while regulating the banks and maintaining a financial stability of America. The monetary policies of the Federal Reserve are twofold. To foster the overall economic conditions to achieve maximum employment and to understand the economic trends of the interest rate movements. Now your bank will often directly link itself with the interest rates of the federal rate and as the federal reserve system is a federal organization its chairman is appointed by the president and confirmed by the senate margin now margin refers to borrowing money from a broker to purchase stocks or other securities and what this does is it leverages your accounts to make more investments allowing for greater potential returns However, it only increases the risk. See, if your investment loses its value, you could face a margin call, which requires you to deposit more funds or the broker could sell your assets at a loss. To simplify margin, it's simply a broker giving you a loan on your portfolio as collateral. And margin calls can be dependent on your individual broker. All brokers have the right to close your accounts to the extent a trade goes negative using your portfolio as collateral. And a broker tends to close them whenever they see a negative trade happening. But when using margin, it's important to understanding the risks and should only be used by an advanced investor. Options. Now options are another investment strategy which are financial derivatives. And what this means is it lets you bet on the future price of stocks without actually having to buy them. Meaning it's not the asset itself, but a contract linked to the potential buying of the actual asset. Options give you the right, but not the obligation to buy or sell an asset at a predetermined price within a specific time frame. And they can be used to leverage or hedge against a speculation, but it requires you to have a really good understanding of the overall stock market to use effectively. Over the past few years, we saw a rally of beginning investors using options, and this is all because often the greater returns of options allow over the stock comparisons. But with greater returns come greater risks. Options, unlike stock, aren't tied to an actual asset and can lose all of their value. And if things don't go as planned, you can lose your entire portfolio. The gold standard. Now the gold standard is an overall monetary system where the country's currency or paper money is actually directly linked to gold. And the, golds, and the gold standard was a global basis for the overall international monetary system until the early 1920s. But it was in 1971 where the United States actually ended its gold standard. And while the gold standard is no longer used by any government, its history offers a valuable insight into the evolution of the current financial system and how intrinsic value of physical currencies tie to actual digital systems. Ponzi schemes. Ponzi schemes are fraud investing scams, and these promise high rates of return with little to no risk. They only generate returns for early investors through the revenue paid by new investors. Rarely are Ponzi's actual good investing practices. Ponzi's are never an actual investing practice and almost always collapse due to no more participants. For a Ponzi, see an example of the story of Bernie Madoff, the largest known Ponzi scheme in history, worth a valued estimated $65 billion. 
He was at one time the chairman of the NASDAQ stock exchange, so he actually had trust from investors in the financial industry. And what he did was create a private fund with new investors promising high rates of return of as high as 20%. But he would only use the funds of later investors to pay earlier investors, only creating an illusion of a profitable enterprise. This cycle effectively continued until his inevitable collapse, revealing that at the end, all of the returns were actually a mirage built on a house of cards. The money that was put into the fund was only to cover his personal lavish lifestyle. So before you put your money into any organization, understand how it works. Does it make its money by selling a product or does it make its money by getting new investors? Level 6 Hedge Funds Now, hedge funds are private investment funds. These are often in the form of private companies that raise funds from private investors that are able to deploy diverse investing strategies. These types of risks can allow funds to earn active returns for investors. These risks allow funds to earn an active return for their investors, which is a different type from the public market. But like the name suggests, these investments are hedges against the main methods. So these can be complex strategies and depending on the overall risk expectation that the fund allows. They can invest in a wide range of assets and often use leverage to enhance the returns like private markets or real estate. And while it can lead to a higher return, they often lead to a higher risk. However, the main downside is that the average investor is usually However, the main downside for the average investor is that they usually only allow accredited or institutional investors, meaning the majority of investors are not eligible to even use them. Short selling. Now, short selling is a strategy used by investors who believe that a stock price will actually decline. This involves buying or borrowing shares to sell at the current price and hoping to buy them back later at a lower price for profit. To close a short position, a trader repurchases the shares, hopefully at a price that's less than the initial borrowed asset. They then return them to the lender or broker. While this can be lucrative, it's also risky, because if the stock price rises, the losses can be much greater. A popular case of short selling was actually during 2008 recession, where investors were actually short selling the stocks and housing markets. The Big Short's a movie that actually broke this down for most beginners to understand. Insider Trading Insider trading involves trading a public company stock or other securities based on non-public or private information. This can be involved in any position, where even a company employee trading on the information that was talked about in an internal meeting, or even an outsider that gets information from someone that's working within the company or organization. Overall, this is fraudulent, illegal, and unethical. The whole reason for this law is to give all traders a fair standing when investing, as insider trading does give insiders an unfair advantage and can overall undermine the fairness and the integrity of the financial systems. Understanding legal implications of insider trading is essential for every investor to make sure that they don't break the law. There have been many documented cases where executives and even politicians have broken this law. Cryptocurrency Now, cryptocurrency is a more modern concept but it represents an independent digital or even virtual currency that uses cryptography for security. And cryptocurrency specifically is separate from the current digital system that we use to interact with our digital banks. This can be seen as a new form of currency that can be created by people or independent companies. But this is a new asset class that has captured the attention of investors for high returns. But remember, with high returns comes volatility. And with crypto trading, comes the uncertainties of regulatory action. But while many cryptocurrencies were created for functional use cases, Many cryptocurrencies were actually created for no reason other than the hopes of investing in rug pulls. And this is where cryptocurrency as a whole may be misunderstood. What once was a technical option to separate the problems of the overall banking system has turned into the wild west of gambling. Crypto as a whole is still in its early stages and will likely see major changes and advancements for the years to come. Level 7 Mortgage Backed Securities now, mortgage-backed securities are a really complex financial tool that allows investments based on bundled mortgages. These mortgages are bundled and then sold as cash flows to investors. Mortgage-backed securities plays a notorious role in the 2008 financial crisis due to their complexity and high default rates. See, not all housing is rated the same. Mortgage-backed securities is rated on a scale from AAA with a low-risk default rates down to lower letters with a high default rate. But the issues would come when you mix lower-rated properties into upper-rated properties. The movie The Big Short did a great job explaining on the entire financial system, but after you watch it, you'll understand how this level of complexity will eventually lead to the housing collapse. High-Frequency Trading High-frequency trading is the modern way of trading with the typical scenes of Wall Street as the floor of the brokers yelling buy and sell, but the actual trading is much more advanced with a much more complicated system than back then. 
High frequency trading represents the technology of the trading, which is often completed by the automated algorithms. This is where large computer systems can actually execute large numbers of orders at lightning speeds. At this level of trading, it can significantly influence the market prices and liquidity. At this scale of trading, it can heavily influence the market prices and liquidity. While many beginning traders start off manually trading, many of the larger firms actually use automated processes. While it's a controversial practice, the efficiency is undeniable. What once used to be completed within hours or if not days can now be completed within seconds. Tax havens. Now tax havens are just countries or jurisdictions that attract foreign investors with comparative or low tax rates. A tax haven is just the term for these kinds of locations. Sometimes these are used negatively to describe places with very low tax rates for non-residential investors. Because tax havens like the Cayman Islands have become famous for offering low or no tax rates for wealthy investors. And it's situations like the Panama paper scandal which actually shed some light on the secretive world of offshore banking. What this highlighted was the legal and ethical dilemmas that wealthy individuals are able to take advantage of. Many wealthy investors are actually even able to shed their wealth from being taxed. These are methods that unfortunately the average working individual does not have access to. Foreign banking. Now foreign banking is something that I wanted to talk about right after tax havens because foreign banks is just strictly being able to put your money in another organization outside of your own country. There are multiple pros and cons with international bank accounts. One popular one has been the notable Swiss bank accounts, which has always been synonymous with privacy and security. Now, while foreign banking has been tightened with regulations over recent years, these accounts still offer advantages like asset protection and privacy that your country may not allow. But in order to take advantage of this, you need to understand your legal and tax implications for anyone considered banking abroad. Level 8. The Petrodollar. Now, the petrodollar system is essentially an aspect of the global oil market. This is where a country uses the American dollar to strictly buy oil. The petrodollar was created in the 1970s through an agreement signed by the United States and Saudi Arabia. This is an international arrangement that has bolstered the American dollar status as the world's dominant reserve currency, as a majority of export and import of oil is completed with the American dollar. This has had a profound implication for global economics, including trade balances, inflation rates, and the monetary policies. Because having oil exclusively traded on the American dollar has allowed it to be globally the most traded and requested currency. But with the global war conflicts of oil has always been a debated topic. BRICS Now BRICS is a standing for the combination acronym of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. But combined, BRICS members encompass about 30% of the world's land surface and 45% of the global population. BRICS represents a coalition of merge of countries challenging the traditional economic dominance of Western countries, mainly the current established financial policies of the United States and Europe. This offers a counterbalance to the established economic powers and presents a new investment landscapes for geopolitical dynamics. But one of the biggest areas of discussion during the 2023 BRICS summit was there was a discussion for a new common currency traded between the countries. This can have a large implication for the global currency, which is the American dollar. Overall, BRICS has received both praise and criticism from global leaders. ESG Now, ESG stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance, and this is an established set of considerations, which include environmental issues, social issues, and corporate governance that's considered during financial investing. And while it may be used for financial investing, ESG was a concept first developed by the United Nations. BlackRock and other large investment groups use it as a social vetting process before deploying capital. But in recent years, this additional social criteria has become a critical standard in evaluating companies before investment. And the three main factors for ESG are one, how a company safeguards the overall environment, two, how it manages relationships with employees and suppliers, and three, the overall practices of good governance within an organization. While the main use case for it was investing ethically and sustainably to align financial returns with long-term societal benefits, Many have had issues with the financial aligning of ESG, believing that the financial investment for companies like BlackRock gives too much oversight and direction of companies. This was even critiqued when the company Tesla was removed from an ESG fund, even though people believe Tesla meets the requirements. Now this iceberg video covered many personal finance related topics, but I'm sure I missed a few, so make sure you subscribe for those videos. Or let me know what topics I missed down in the comments below, or feel free to check out this video of more money tips.